Uh, wonderful. Um, thank you so much uh, again, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Sandra Tsai, for joining us today uh, for the for our uh, science series on the topic of preventive cardiology. Um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Tsai is a clinical associate professor of medicine at Stanford and also uh, by courtesy at Stanford Prevention Re Research Center. Um, she has earned her, uh, her medical degree from University of Texas Southwestern Medical School in Dallas and her MPH from the University of California in Berkeley. She completed her internal medicine uh, residency at University of Texas Southwestern and her postdoctoral fellowship in cardiology disease prevention at Stanford Prevention Research Center. She currently sees patients in the Women's Heart uh, uh, Health Clinic, Preventive Con Cardiology Clinic, and Stanford Hypertension, Heart, Heart, Hypertension Center uh, and primary care. Her specialties include hypertension, abnormal cholesterol, weight management, and postpartum consult counseling in women with adverse pregnancy outcomes. We are very pleased to have you here with us, uh, uh, Dr. Tsai. Thank you so much uh, for your time and expertise. Please take it over. Great. Thank you, everyone. Good morning. So I will start and share my screen. So we are going to be going over the ABCs of proven cardiology. I will do a presentation mode. Okay. Um, so Susan, do you see that section that says subtitles aren't currently available or is that just on my screen? Um, no, that's what we see as well. Oh, I I'd love to get rid of that. I don't know how though. Um, mm -hmm. Hopefully that doesn't bother anyone. Let me see if there's a way to get rid of that. Um, as long as it doesn't bother you, <laughs> like it's it's on my screen. I'd love to get rid of it, but I can't. So, um, okay, so let's go ahead and get started. So oh, ABC, it's gone now. Perfect. Oh, it's gone now. Okay. So ABC is a preventive cardiology. Um, initially, when I thought of this title, I was like, oh, it's just going to be the basics of preventive cardiology. So that's why I did the ABCs. And I thought I should actually have an acronym. So here's my acronym for ABCs. Um, assessment. So we will discuss the cardiovascular risk assessment and how we do that and what that means. Background. So background, just thinking about what uh, are the risk factors, traditional and non-traditional for developing cardiovascular disease. And then C stands for care, which is recognizing what the current guidelines are for treating cardiovascular risk factors and what we use. So we'll go through pharmaceuticals as well as lifestyle. So the first question, and I'm just going to have you guys answer in the chat. So these are open-ended questions, but I'd love to hear what you all think. I know that all of you are in, in, involved in research and I'd love to hear what you all think when you, when you hear cardiovascular disease, what comes to mind? And you can just put anything that you want in the chat. And I think Susan's gonna be monitoring. I think I can also see some of the answers that pop up, I hope. Yes, please everyone, um, please go ahead and put your answers on the, in the chat. So, um, feel free to unmute as well. If you would like to unmute yourself and answer, that's fine as well. Great, athro, heart attack, strokes, any sort of dysfunction in the heart, great. A lot of heart disease, athro, perfect. Okay, so exactly. And also the thing that I usually like to point out is um, this is what most people think. They think in bold at the coronary artery disease, sort of this idea or the process of athro developing, narrowing uh, the lumen of an artery. But cardiovascular disease also includes hypertension, stroke, heart failure. So typically when we think about cardiovascular disease, we also include these other entities. Uh, and so in terms of looking at st statistics, cardi this is cardiovascular disease deaths. So number of people who die between 1980 to 2019. Uh, men are represented in blue and women in red. And I think you can clearly see there was a steady decline in cardiovascular disease deaths in men um, up until 2010. And there's been a steady rise. Uh, for women, there's been a, bit of a little bit of a plateau, if not an increase in cardiovascular deaths until 2000. And then we see a steady decline until 2010. And again, there's been a an, an steady increase for women as well. Men are now surpassing uh, women. So women initially had more deaths, as you can see. And then, uh, but now men have surpassed again. Um, but one of the reasons why this happened, this curve looks different than in men, 
is because women were not included in clinical trials for quite some time. And once they were included more like heavily intentionally recruited into clinical trials, we learned a lot more about cardiovascular disease in women and how to treat it. And they, when we actually started to improve uh, uh, their um, risk for death. In terms of uh, different ethnic groups, cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death of all racial ethnic groups in the United States. So this is broken down by ethnic groups. So you can see this is men, this is women. These are uh, black individuals, um, whites, uh, Hispanic, and Asian. So it, far, it exceeds um, other uh, causes of death in all ethnic groups. So I did want to focus a little bit on other uh, types of heart disease. So we talked about coronary artery disease, which we will get into uh, a lot more further down in the talk, but I also wanted to mention two other entities, microvascular disease and endothelial dysfunction. So microvascular disease really involves the microvasculature. So you can see these, these are called epicardial arteries. So the big arteries on the outside of the heart are epicardial arteries that you see here. But underneath them are, is, are the microvasculature. So this is, as you, it's really vast and plays a, a really important role in uh, feeding the muscular, the, the heart muscles. And then this is a structure of an artery wall, which includes this uh, thin layer here called the endothelium, which we'll get into. So let's talk about endothelial dysfunction. So it is that layer of cells that lines the inside of all of our arteries. And it plays a very important role in vascular tone, which basically means it plays a very important role in dilating and in constricting. And in also it has, it regulates a lot of things that happen in the bloodstream and the surrounding tissues because it secretes and allow it's permeable. And also it secretes substances uh, to help with the vascular function. And so an endothelial, when it's, when the endothelium is dysfunctional, it has, it, what, it, what happens is it's unable to optimally perform its normal functions. And so people can, can actually have uh, chest pain and what looks just like you, what you think of as the uh, stenosis, like the same sort of symptoms can happen when people have endothelial dysfunction. The other one is the coronary microvascular dysfunction. So the microvascular are these little arteries. And again, they can uh, when we think about dysfunction, we're thinking about their impaired dilation or increased constriction. So this is a normal vessel. So if it's constricting abnormally um, and not being allowed to vasodilate, you can imagine that it acts just like a stenosis or it can feel, and the symptoms can be similar to when it's stenotic. And the microvascular vessels, they can become obstructed or have small emboli that become diseased over time. So just like the epicardial arteries, these can form plaque inside of them and they can die because, and they're much, much smaller in caliber. So it's easier for these to get diseased. Um, it can be endothelial dependent or independent. So people can have microvascular disease on, and then on top of that endothelial dysfunction, uh, causing them to have uh, heart disease. And then I wanted to talk about atherosclerotic plaque and how it develops. So in general, there, is, there are stages to how atherosclerotic plaque develops, but plaque is basically uh, here. These are fatty deposits in, inside of the arterial wall. It, it's embedded on the inside. It's made up of cholesterol, cellular waste products, calcium, and fibrin. And this is um, an, a, the age. So basically, this is sort of the progress. Let me see, was there a, uh, oh, it doesn't tell you the age, but oh yeah, yeah. So this is your first decade, your second decade, or your third decade, and um, your fourth decade. So over time, what this is basically saying is atherosclerotic disease can really develop very early. You can see that this is a normal wall, but over time, if things are embedding inside the, the arterial wall, it just, it, it can develop over, it takes decades usually for it to develop in people. And for some people, it starts earlier than for other people. Um, in terms of what we know about athro now, we know that it is a chronic inflammatory disease. And so this part is very important to remember. It's a chronic inflammatory disease. And so inflammation characterizes all stages of plaque development. And the way uh, we've learned a lot about how this develops, and essentially 
we our immune system is the normal part of our system that fights infection. And if it's chronically activated, what happens essentially is monocytes, which are part of your immune system, they become recruited inside of, this is the inside of the arterial wall. So this is the artery. This is the other side. This is sort of the intima here. So these monocytes get recruited and changed into, and differentiate into macrophages. And these macrophages, their job is to uh, take up additional LDL particles. So if you've got a lot of LDL particles in your bloodstream, they'll come in and they'll be eaten up by macrophages and they'll form, form foam cells. And these foam cells will change over time, but that, that's what's building up inside of this arterial wall. And things like sheer stress, so things like high blood pressure, for example, can cause an abnormality of this endothelial lining that's basically allowing this process to happen. Um, I always like to go over symptoms of angina. So when we talk about angina, this is the chest pain that people get because they either have a stenotic lesion or endothelial dysfunction or microvascular dysfunction. And angina is what usually, typically it's exertional. So people can have a symptom of a heart attack, but it's really not quite a heart attack. It's just, um, it's evidence that the heart muscle is not getting enough blood flow when the, 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 the heart rate is increased. So exertional chest discomfort, uh, not typically at rest, but if someone's exercising and what the, what'll happen is they're exercising, they'll get the symptom, they'll stop exercising um, or stop exerting themselves and the symptom will go away. They start again when the symptom comes back. That's classic angina. Um, it can also come as the form of exertional shortness of breath. It does not have to be chest discomfort, but this is the most common symptom. Um, other things that can happen is people can feel it in their jaw or their upper back, um, their left shoulder, left, left arm. But typically one of the biggest things, the most important things to remember is it does have an, ex it typically has an exertional component for some, for women, sometimes they can get it under just stress, psychological stress. And this is a little, this is basically different than myocardial infarction or an MI, which is where there is a, you know, what's happening with a, an MI is that there's a fixed lesion. There's a complete blockage in the artery. And um, subsequently, distally, there is death of myocardial tissue. And when people have symptoms of a myocardial infarction, again, it is chest discomfort, most common. Um, it's squeezing, it can be pressure. It, it pretty much won't stop. Um, it can come with intense fatigue, shortness of breath. Um, it'll be more escalated. So people can have nausea, vomiting. Again, some of these additional symptoms, cold sweats, light, lightheadedness. And then women may have, in addition to the chest pain, which I, like I said, it's the most common um, in men and women, um, they'll ex they may experience some other common symptoms like um, the nausea and, you know, having upper back pain, um, some, oh, sometimes they can get indigestion or it'll feel like a GI symptom, um, fainting and, uh, or extreme fatigue, like we've sort of talked about, and it can be brought on by emotional stress. So now I want to talk a little bit about the background. Um, we have traditional risk factors, uh, which many of you I'm sure know all about. Um, so I'd love to see what, uh, what comes to mind when you think about traditional cardiovascular risk factors. And you can, again, just Put it in the chat, but actually there's some questions here. Oh no, those are not for me, okay. But yeah, so anything that comes to mind when you think about, um, what are some traditional risk factors that you guys can think about? There is actually a question, but we can uh, go uh, over it another, later, later on after this question. Okay, the question great. was, what is the number like N? for men and me, men and me, women. Oh, in terms of deaths, deaths. Oh, okay. No, so I, mean, I, can... I don't know what is, what is, is, was this when uh, Sandra was talking about death? Uh, when, when did you put this question in? Maybe we missed right on the, on the topic, but please oh, unmute was... and mention what, what, what do you mean by number for, for what? That was my question. <clears throat> in the beginning, you presented the statistics. Yes. Uh, for men and women. Yes. And then I was wondering that what the numbers were uh, in the study for men and women. Yeah, uh, got it. Okay. So yes, I can, I can go back to that slide and answer that question. Um, 
I wonder if I should do this. Um, Susan, do you think I should do that now or just um, maybe try and answer at the end? Uh, I would say at the end, yes, because okay. now we are uh, getting answers for the questions. So. Okay, okay. So um, so some of the cardiovascular, so sorry about missing that question initially, but we'll definitely get back to it. Um, so traditional risk factors, genetics, so family history, your lifestyle, diabetes, hypertension, lipids, obesity. Great. So these are these are very, very classic traditional cardiovascular risk factors. So we like to break up risk factors into what we call uh, non-modifiable and modifiable. Um, so non-modifiable ones are helpful to us because this is how we determine what we think your risk level is. So as you all know, the older we get, the more at risk we are for cardiovascular disease. Uh, sex, men and women have just as much heart disease, but uh, men tend to have it earlier than women. So sex matters when we're thinking about a risk assessment. Family history matters. This is a huge one. So um, we consider a family history to be significant if it's early. So as we all know, cardiovascular disease happens the older you get. So if we consider it to be a genetic predisposition, if the, if the uh, coronary artery disease is happening early, and we consider early to be if you have a first degree male relative, uh, male relative, so this is not a grandfather, but rather, or an uncle, but this is a father or a brother who has heart disease uh, when they were less than 55 years old. Uh, a female first degree relative, mother, sister, who has heart disease less than 65 years old. So you can actually see here, there's a 10 year difference because men have heart disease approximately 10 years earlier than women. Okay, on average, okay? So that is considered a significant family history. Modifiable things are some of the things that you guys noticed uh, listed already. Hypertension, whether you smoke or not, your lipids, your glucose, uh, what's your diet like, your physical activity level, and what's your weight. So in terms of looking at the modifiable risk factors, I just wanted to let you know what ideal, what we consider to be ideal. So we want your LDL less than 100, ideally, and we want your HDL above 60, ideally. Um, above 60 and call it less than 85, once the HDL gets quite high, it actually is not as protective. So we know this now. Um, we used to not realize that HDL had an upper limit cutoff, but for people who have HDLs above the level of 85 to 90, there's probably a lot of that that's dysfunctional. Um, a blood pressure ideal is less than 120 over 80, ideal glucose less than 100. We, an ideal diet is high in fiber and low in saturated fats. Um, exercising ideal would be at least 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity activity. An ideal BMI is less than 25 for Europeans and less than 23 for Asians. And then ideal for smoking is not smoking. And I, then I wanted to talk on something, talk on this topic called cardiometabolic syndrome, which I'm, I'm sure many of you have also heard this term. Um, it's a constellation of risk factors that increases your risk for having type two diabetes and atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and is defined by unifying pathophysiology. It is a chronic progressive pathophysiologic state, which basically means that this underlying pathophysiology, the longer you have it, it progressively gets worse. If we don't reverse this cardiometabolic syndrome, it continues to get worse and it, it increases your risk more and more that you're gonna um, end up with type two diabetes or atherosclerotic disease. It has the question been- question is here, it, the, oh. the, the, the ranges you uh, mentioned, is it, uh -huh. um, she, he's asking, is it for fasting glucose? It is for fasting glucose. Yes, it is for fasting glucose. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, so cardiometabolic syndrome is an under, it's been under recognized as an important cardiovascular risk factor. So, you know, we talk very, we talk separately about your blood pressure and your lipids and, you know, things like that. But really, uh, for many people who have multiple risk factors, if we actually put them all together and we, and we try and see who meets the definitions for cardiometabolic syndrome, that is kind of the thing that we oftentimes are missing. We oftentimes will identify one risk factor and then another risk factor where we're not really putting them all together and thinking about the fact that you have cardiometabolic syndrome and we need to really get rid of the cardiometabolic syndrome. Okay. Um, and it was, like I said, it's, it's been under-recognized, but finally in 2018, the ACCAHA, the cholesterol guidelines, the updated cholesterol guidelines included 
this metabolic syndrome as a risk enhancer because they are recognizing the importance that your metabolism and having a healthy metabolism really plays into your risk for developing atherosclerosis. So metabolic syndrome, so the reason why it's called cardiometabolic um, is because cardiometabolic is really trying to emphasize the idea that having metabolic syndrome increases your risk for cardiac disease. So that's why we're, so you'll hear this term cardiometabolic syndrome a lot because of this very close association. Um, so metabolic syndrome is defined by five different factors. Uh, the first one is visceral obesity, which is basically fat in the middle of the abdomen. Insulin resistance, which is basically when your insulin is not your, you have insulin resistance and it's characterized by the fact that your peripheral tissues are resistant to the signaling from insulin. Hypertension, high triglycerides, and low HDL. So when we see someone who has a constellation of these factors, they have metabolic syndrome. Okay. So that's the definition to actually meet the definition. You only have to have three of the five, but, um, most many, many people will have all five. Okay. So I really wanted to stress this point because I feel like it oftentimes, um, we, you're, you know, we're only addressing one thing at a time, but we really need to understand the importance of people having this constellation of symptoms. This is a very interesting study that looks at metabolic syndrome and its risk for atherosclerotic disease. So this particular study found that ASCVD risk rises exponentially as the number of cardiometabolic elements increases. So this was a population-based study in the Netherlands included about 2,500 people, all of them, and it's a prospective study. All of them were free of cardiovascular disease and diabetes at the start of the study. They were between the ages of 50 and 75, and they were followed from 1989 through 2000. And what they're looking, what this particular study was looking for was the composite cardiovascular endpoint was morbidity and mortality. So these are Kaplan-Meier survival curves. And basically um, this is men and this is women. And I think what you can very clearly see here is that they would divide this population into those who did not have cardiometabolic syndrome and those who did have cardiometabolic syndrome. Okay, so this is for men and this is for women. So you can see that people who don't have cardiometabolic syndrome, they have better survival rates than those who do have cardiometabolic syndrome. This is very true for men and women. Then when you actually come over here and you separate the number of cardiometabolic elements they have, and this is considered, if you look here, this is considered, um, uh, okay, so this is like more, so this is least, so this is one, this is two elements, three elements, and four or more elements. So I think you can very clearly see that the more cardiometabolic elements you see, the worse your survival. Um, this is especially true, you can see, for men in comparison to women. The question is, uh, is this uh, uh, probably on the ra race and ethnicity, is this mostly for white? Oh, um, th this, what? yeah, um, that was probably a predominantly white, but in general, uh, the theme is true for all ethnic groups. This, that was a population study of primarily white uh, participants, but it's, it's very much true for all ethnic groups. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's talk about insulin resistance because that is actually at the heart of cardiometabolic syndrome. So insulin resistance, um, what happens when we eat is we eat food, uh, the glucose goes into our bloodstream. In response, the pancreas secretes insulin. Insulin speaks to peripheral tissues and, and it basically tells these peripheral tissues, I've got glucose, please take it. So this glucose will enter into the liver to be stored. Um, it will enter into skeletal muscle to be used. And so that's what normally happens. In someone who has insulin resistance, um, what happens is again, glucose into the bloodstream, insulin secreted in response, but because someone is insulin resistant, the insulin is trying to speak to these tissues, but very little glucose is getting in because these tissues are resistant. And the worse this insulin resistance gets, 
um, the less glucose is being moved into these organs and the glucose will actually build up into the bloodstream. And when it's less severe, it's prediabetes. When it's more severe, it's type two diabetes. And so in terms of A1C, these are the ranges for prediabetes is 5.7 to 6.4 and A1C range of 6.5 and above for type two diabetes. We not only see A1C evidence of insulin resistance, but it actually does appear on the skin. This is one way that we can tell someone's got insulin resistance is insulin resistance uh, tends to manifest, manifest itself in skin changes because when someone is resistant to insulin, their body secretes a lot of insulin in response. It's like a, it's a physiologic response to being resistant. You're just gonna make more and more insulin to try and overcome the resistance. And what happens is, and people who have high, who are of darker skin color, their melanocytes uh, in response to all this insulin secretion will actually produce more melanin and they will have darker skin like around their neck. So they get a very dark neck. So that's called acanthosis nigricans. The second thing that we see is skin tags. So skin tags appear norm, like normally in some people, but when it starts to appear, especially around axilla, the, the neck where there's a lot of friction. Um, this happens because again, hyperinsulinemia causes keratinocytes, which um, to turn over a lot and to make a lot of them, and then they'll form skin tags. Um, I wanted to also just in terms of visceral adiposity, insulin resistance occurs for several reasons, but the biggest reason, the most common reason is visceral adiposity. The most common reason we see insulin resistance is because people are gaining fat, not just any fat, but fat in their abdomen. And so we measure this with waist circumference. So we consider um, a waist circumference for a female to be too large if it's greater than 35, for a man if it's greater than 40 inches. And for Asians, it's a little bit different. Um, we see a lot of cardiometabolic problems in Asians at a much lower waist circumference. So females, uh, the normal would be less than 31 and for men, less than 35. And then um, our, again, just reemphasizing the body mass index cutoffs for Europeans, 25 and for Asians, 23. And the reason why these cutoffs is again, just because we see more cardiometabolic disease at a lower BMI for Asians. Adipose tissue. So it's really, you know, Insulin resistance is largely due to visceral adiposity, and it's because adipose tissue is a is especially when it's when it's central inside in the middle of the belly, it's a very active organ and it's doing a lot of damage. So we used to think that adipose tissue was just a place that we stored fat and people didn't like it, but now we basically know that adipose tissue it's not inert; it's quite active. It is the largest endocrine organ in your body. And endocrine organs are organs that secrete things for your body function. So your adipose tissue is an endocrine organ. It secretes more than a hundred different factors that play a role in glucose metabolism, your appetite, inflammatory signaling, your immune system, your blood pressure, and your, and your reproductive function, just to name a few. Um, okay, so that was that was sort of setting up we, the idea that there's a lot of these traditional risk factors that we know about, but we've learned a lot about other risk factors that are a little bit less well-known, but are definitely emerging in the literature as being very important. So we're calling these, uh, or they, they are termed non-traditional risk factors because I think they're termed this just because they're not as well-known, but they, they definitely have an impact. Um, so I wanted to see what non-traditional cardiovascular risk factors um, people could um, come to mind. if any, and if not, okay, so, okay. So uh, let's talk about some then, this will be good. So one of them is uh, South Asian ethnicity is considered a risk factor. So um, South Asians, it's a one quarter of the world's population. South Asians have very high rates of cardiovascular disease compared to other ethnic groups. And they not only have high rates, they tend to develop it much earlier. And so these are the just these are the South Asian countries, and they have and, and not only cardiovascular disease, but really they have a very high prevalence of cardio of type two diabetes compared to 
whites. So the reason we ask about ethnicity and the reason why we tend to be on high alert if we have South Asian patients is because we know that they can develop early and have severe cardiovascular disease um, and be at risk. The other non-traditional risk factor is uh, our complications in pregnancy. So for our women, for our female patients, we like to ask about their pregnancy history because pregnancy gives us an idea of what their future cardiometabolic health is gonna look like because what happens in pregnancy mimics a lot of the cardiometabolic changes that happen when a woman is uh, postmenopausal or getting uh, or older in life. So some of the complications that we think about are hypertension and the more, more severe form is preeclampsia and diabetes. So when women have either of these in pregnancy, it definitely increases their risk for having not only future cardiovascular disease, but um, hypertension and um, cardiometabolic disease. So, and it's because these, again, there's a lot of cardiometabolic changes that happen in pregnancy. And so even after they deliver the baby, they are, we know that they are at risk for developing these things after they give birth and very soon after they give birth. So, um, so this is a part of what is so important about understanding a woman's pregnancy history. The second one is autoimmune disorders. So autoimmune disorders predominantly affect women, uh, but also they do affect some men, but predominantly it's women. So lupus, for example, is an autoimmune disorder and has a tenfold increased risk for cardiovascular disease and premature coronary artery disease. So this is a, a, a very big risk factor. Rheumatoid arthritis also increases your risk for having cardiovascular disease. Um, we talked about, oh, and also autoimmune disorders tend to affect young women predominantly. Uh, many women will develop these when they're in their 20s, 30s, 40s. And it is, be, the problem with autoimmune diseases is that inflammation is a hallmark of all of autoimmune disorders. And like I was saying before, atherosclerosis is a chronic inflammatory disease. So anything that increases your inflammation, any disorder that increases your inflammation, especially if it's chronic, will increase your risk for cardiovascular disease. Um, at least in terms of the association between autoimmune diseases and cardiovascular disease, it's, it's multifactorial. It tends to also involve microvascular disease and endothelial dysfunction with these, with these patients. Another one is menopause. Uh, so menopause and it's accelerated cardiovascular risk. So during menopause, uh, during this transition time from premenopause to menopause, there is not only a change in hormones, but there's also a change in body fat distribution and a change in people's lipids. So in terms of menopause, because we know that in menopause, there's a lot of things that change. Women who have premature menopause are at increased risk for heart disease as well. So we consider premature menopause to be menopause that occurs for whatever reason before the age of 40. It could be surgical, it could be uh, medical, it doesn't matter. Uh, and, and then in terms of the, it increases the risk for non-fatal cardiovascular disease. So you, these are hazard ratios um, and like it can increase the risk by 55%. Um, it was initially not, again, under-recognized and then placed in the 2018 cholesterol guidelines, which I'll go over in a little bit as a risk enhancer, just recognizing its importance. And we talked about menopause predisposed predisposes to cardiovascular risk factors. And one of the reasons is because in menopause, we see that women will start to gain fat. And not only do they gain fat in general, they, they tend to gain fat in this apple pattern. So uh, women can gain fat either as an apple pattern or as a pear. So pear being where it's sort of the lower extremity adiposity, where it's in the thighs and the buttocks, where central adiposity, which often happens around menopause is really right inside the waist. So what a lot of women will notice is they'll get the subcutaneous adipose tissue, but they'll also get the visceral adipose tissue. And in exchange, they lose lean muscle. So it's sort of a double whammy because when you, when you lose lean muscle, your metabolism gets worse. And then on top of that, if you're gaining a lot of fat in the middle, it is that double, that double whammy. The other thing that happens in menopause is the lipid profile becomes more atherogenic. So what do we mean by that? So a more atherogenic lipid profile means that your lipids uh, are more likely to embed themselves inside the arterial lining. So we call that more atherogenic. So what happens is that 
for some women, they will notice that their total cholesterol will go up and their LDL will go up. And they may have either normal or borderline lipids pre-menopause and then menopause this really over just a matter of years can increase dramatically. Um, and then the other thing that I had touched on was this HDL for some women, they will notice that their HDL will lower and the HDL tends to lower when women become more, they become less metabolically healthy. We tend to see the HDL fall and less metabolic, metabolically healthy basically means that as women during this menopause time, as they're moving closer to pre-diabetes or diabetes, uh, because maybe they've gained weight, et cetera, their HDL comes down. For other women, they will find that their HDL will increase in menopause. It'll go from 70s or 80s to like 100, you know, in menopause. So it can either decrease or increase. It, it, it kind of is very dependent on their genetics. But if we see that HDL increase in menopause, it usually is, is signaling to us that some of this HDL is not protective anymore and that it is, um, it's either not protective and possibly even a negative thing. Uh, another another non-traditional risk factor is uh, considered childhood adversity. So this can be either child abuse, emotional or physical, sexual neglect. It can also include just household dysfunction. So divorces in the family, um, uh, your death of the family, you know, of your parents, incarceration of your parents. Uh, out your drug and alcohol abuse by your parents, any of these, any of these things are considered childhood adversities. And we know that, and this tends to affect more uh, women than men. They tend to be exposed to more childhood adversities. It's a stronger predictive uh, predictor of cardiovascular disease in women. And um, in terms of its mechanism, <clears throat> it tends to having childhood adversities can set people up for having mental health disorders, worse lifestyle. Uh, there is a neurobiologic stress response that happens in children through adulthood. We see this all the time. And so all of this, it's probably multimodal, mul multiple reasons why it's connected, but we definitely see that it is a risk factor. Depression is a risk factor for coronary heart disease. Um, it is one and a half times more common in women than men. And it is associated with worse outcomes after a coronary artery um, event. So this is something that we, you know, like in our women's heart health clinic and in cardiology in general, there is a cardiac behavioral medicine section because we recognize that first, we, we really need to be paying attention to the mental health portion for anyone who has cardiovascular disease. Um, and just to highlight that, so the inner heart study is, <clears throat> is a population study that was uh, worldwide and included 52 countries around the world. And what they found was that there were nine modifiable risk factors that accounted for over 90% of first MI for people. So you can see here um, the traditional ones, smoking, your diet, exercise, alcohol, hypertension, diabetes, uh, obesity, psychosocial is something that they, they recognize, your lipids. Um, and so this is really just to highlight, if you look at just the risk that psychosocial has, it, it is great. It is um, a little bit less in smoking and lipids, but it's even greater than say diabetes. So you can see that psychosocial really does matter and increases a person's risk. And, and, I'll, and I'll get to this later in terms of modifiable things that we need to think about, but this is really something that um, should not be ignored. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna move, I'm gonna shift now from talking about risk factors to talking about prevention and how we think about it. So there's the primordial. So this is reducing the onset of cardiovascular risk factors. There's primary, which is when people have risk factors, how can we prevent them from actually having heart attack or stroke? And then secondary is if they have a heart attack and a stroke, how can we prevent them from having a heart attack and a stroke again? So in terms of guidelines for prevention, we're gonna go through a risk assessment, how we do that lifestyle interventions, and then pharmaceuticals, because all of them play, all of these things play a role. We talk about risk assessment. We have guidelines for these and the 2018-2019 uh, guidelines really are a comprehensive resource for primary prevention of cardiovascular disease. 
And overarching themes is that lifestyle remains foundational. And I think oftentimes we talk about lifestyle, but we don't spend a lot of time emphasizing lifestyle to patients. And lifestyle is definitely very difficult to change, but uh, shared decision-making between, uh, between provider and patients are very, very important and the importance of social determinants of health. And much of ASCVD death is attributable to suboptimal implementation of preventive strategies and uncontrolled risk factors. So this plays a huge role is that we are not, uh, you know, for some people, it's just that we're not giving them the preventive strategies they need. And for other people, we do not have the risk factors under good control at all. So most people with an MI have at least one CBD risk factor that's not in the ideal range. So I'm gonna talk now about this thing called the CV risk calculator. So this was something that was developed in the 2013 prevention guidelines. And what this is, is uh, the name of it is a pooled cohort equation. And what it does is it includes all of these different factors that we plug into a calculator, uh, uh, the PCE, this pooled cohort equation. We plug all of these factors into the PCE and it spits out the 10 year risk that a person's gonna have either a stroke or a heart attack or symptoms of a stroke or a heart attack. So symptoms that, these are the traditional things that you've heard of, your age, sex, what's your blood pressure, what's your total cholesterol, your HDL, do you have diabetes, do you have hypertension, and is it treated? But what are some of the factors that are not included? And so just from some of the, so what do you guys notice about this calculator that some of the things that are, that are not included in this calculator? Okay, so some of the, and I mean, basically, I think, I don't know how to go back on my thing. Let me go back. Oh, do I go? Oh, here we go. So, you know, the thing is, in terms of risk factors, we've talked about a lot about all these non traditional risk factors. None of them are in the tent and are in this calculator. And so that can make this calculator difficult to use because what happens is this calculator tends to underestimate a women's risk, for example. So most women, they will not, this calculator will not increase their risk enough until they're probably about the age of 70. So this tends to underestimate a woman's risk. Uh, the other thing it tends to do is it doesn't include anything about a family history. And we know family history is a very strong risk factor and, and very predictive for people. So it doesn't include anything about family history. So there's a lot of uh, limitations to this calculator. And that's really the main thing I wanted to highlight is that we tend to use this to help us get like initial picture of what we think a person's risk is. But then we, we do um, a history, all this different history. We look at all these different labs because we're really trying to refine what this initial risk score is. But we, do, we tend to start with this. So the, the, 20, these, the cholesterol guidelines, these prevention guidelines, what it tells us is we should use this risk score for people and it, we should, and th these are the risk scores right here. And then based on these risk scores, we should decide what to do. And like I was mentioning before, these guidelines have put in here, these things called ASCD risk enhancers. So this is a list of risk enhancers, which we're going to go over. Um, but essentially uh, what we consider to be high risk, really good evidence that someone who has a 10 year risk score of 20% or greater is at very high risk for stroke and heart attack in the next 10 years. So these folks, we pretty much start them on or offer them a statin. For, the, for people who are in this intermediate category right here between 7.5 and less than 20%, it can be a little bit trickier because they, they're indeterminate risk. And for a lot of people who live, like the calculator spits out this score, for a lot of people who are in this category, for some people, they're actually much higher risk than the calculator is saying. For some people, they're actually much lower risk than the calculator is saying. So for a lot of people in this intermediate risk, because it's big, it's a big range. So for a lot of people who are in this, this category, we tend to use risk enhancers to help us understand what's their risk. And we also might use other, other mechanisms like other testing. Um, so let's talk about the risk enhancers. So we know family history. So you'll see a lot of the non-traditional risk factors on here now. So family history, persistently elevated LDL. So even though the LDL, what we consider to be a very, very high LDL is 190, 
when a person's LDL is about 160, if it's persistently above 160, even if it's not quite 190, we know that these people are uh, just at higher risk because their cholesterol is high. Uh, chronic kidney disease, metabolic syndrome, which I've mentioned, conditions specific to women like preeclampsia, premature menopause, inflammatory disorders, which I've mentioned, and ethnicity. So being South Asian has made it as a risk enhancer because we know it's such a strong risk. Uh, other biomarkers um, like elevated triglycerides. So in, for, uh, for a while, for many, many years, we did not consider high triglycerides to be um, that something that we necessarily should do much about. But part of the reason why it's made it onto these risk enhancers list is because high, having high triglycerides is part of metabolic syndrome. And there are grades of triglycerides that can be elevated. So, so some people's triglycerides are 500, other people's triglycerides are 180. And there, there's a big difference there. And so just having persistently elevated triglycerides um, is, is also a risk enhancer. And then these are some of the biomarkers which um, I will touch on a little bit later because sometimes having biomarkers, cardiac biomarkers also give us an idea of what your additional risk is. So let's just say we have patients who are in that intermediate category and we're still, you know, we're just not sure. Are they higher risk than we think? Are they lower risk than we think? We may use something called screening tests. So the first one I'm going to talk about, and this is called, this is considered a cardiac biomarker, is high sensitivity C reactive protein. So this is a, inflammatory marker. And it's the one that we tend to use in cardiology specifically just because it's, it has a higher sensitivity for, for picking up inflammation and also because it's been used in clinical trials. So this is one trial that many of you may have heard of. This is called the Jupiter trial. This was a, a landmark trial that really was looking, it was developed to really look at do patients without any cardiovascular disease, no, they have no cardiovascular disease, do patients benefit from cholesterol medicine, and in this case, Resuva, do they benefit even if their cholesterol is not that high, but their CRP is elevated? So uh, we really like for the HSCRP to be less than 0 0.3. Um, but in terms of the lab, lab, the lab reference range is usually when it's above three, it's considered elevated. So there's a big range. Again, there's a very big range from ideal to what the reference range at the lab will be considered abnormal. But in this particular study, patients were considered, um, it was considered to be elevated if you had a CRP greater than two. So these are people who had all of them, none of them were on, they were not on any lipid lowering therapy, no known cardiovascular disease. They had LDLs less than 130. So really their LDLs were not that high. They were randomized to either Resuva or placebo. And the trial was stopped early after four years because in the intervention arm, they saw that there was a 44% reduction in the primary endpoint, which was MI, stroke, arterial revascularization, hospitalization for unstable angina or death from cardiovascular cause. So they stopped the trial early. And, and what this trial basically said ultimately was that patients with relatively normal looking cholesterol do also benefit from statin therapy if they have an, an elevated CRP. So this was one of the, and this was back in 2008. So this was one of the first trials that really looked at, can people benefit if they've got inflammation? Can they still, you know, can they benefit from statin therapy if they've got inflammation? And so even low, so this, this is a low risk group, such as women um, benefited. Um, and then I was just going to see whether or not anyone knew what statins did to your HSCRP. There is a question uh, asking about the unit of the okay. HRP. Um, is it in two uh, milligram per liter or two milligram per, I don't know what DL stands for, but it says DL. Yeah. So actually, normally it is, um, uh, it's DL, but I, you know, I'm actually, I, you know, for this particular trial, that's a good question for this particular trial, I wrote L. So I'm assuming that's correct. So I will have to check on that. Um, I think it's normally actually deciliters. I think it's normally deciliters. So this might just be a typo, which we can go back and, and, and look, this might just be a typo. Um, okay, but does anyone know what statins do to your HSCRP? 
and they okay so i'll tell you so essentially um statins in, in this group they looked at so you know they knew what their start their initial crp was and then the the statins reduced their crp by about 30 percent and so essentially you know what i often will tell patients is patients will even ask me well my cholesterol is not high why do i need a statin and it's because statins have an anti-inflammatory effect and they decrease your and in this trial they decreased the hscrp which is is really very, very interesting. But um, we, we now know statins do have an anti-inflammatory effect. Okay, the next one is ankle brachial index is another, uh, it's another disease or it's another test that we can use specifically to under, better understand what someone's cardiovascular health looks like. Okay, so um, ankle brachial index is really when we're looking at the ratio of blood pressures um, between the arm and the ankle. And normal is greater than 0.9. And that is because for people who have cardiovascular disease, if they've got any peripheral vascular disease, their pressures here are going to be lower. And so we'll see that differential. Um, does anyone know what people with peripheral arterial disease are at risk for? Why do we care about peripheral arterial disease? Why do we care about that? Does anyone know? Okay, so we care about it for one of the obvious reasons. Oh, good, I've got a response. Let's see, um, emboli formation. Yes, okay, so that's very true. So people can certainly throw emboli um, down distally. So we care about it because um, the, the biggest, biggest thing that can kill someone who has peripheral arterial disease is actually heart disease. So when we see that someone has disease of their arteries, any artery, um, it kind of, gives us an indication that they have this inclination to form plaque. And that means that they could form plaque in their coronary arteries as well. And so that is one of the biggest risk factors. So when we, when someone has peripheral arterial disease, it is painful, like they'll have claudication in their calves. And so that's something that we want to treat. But the bigger issue is we really want to prevent heart attacks and strokes, because these are patients who are at very high risk for heart attacks and strokes. The other screening test that we often use for this intermediate group is something called a coronary artery calcium scan. So this scan, we use it only in prevention. So this is not something that is used to diagnose coronary st artery stenosis. So this is, not a, uh, this is not an angiogram. This is a calcium scan because CT scans are basically large x-rays. And, see, and, and calcium always appears white on an x-ray without any, con no contrast is needed in these scans. So what these are is we are taking a picture with a CT scan and we're looking at the coronary arteries and we're basically looking to see if there's any calcium, it means that there is plaque. Because initially when I told you the composition of athro, I, I put on there that there's calcium in it because calcium as it, as it ages or as plaque ages, more and more calcium tends to embed itself inside the plaque. And so when we, we do these scans to help us understand what's the burden of someone's plaque, um, the radiation amount is low. It's one millisievert. Um, this is, I usually like to compare this to um, when you're just living on the earth for a year, you get about three millisieverts of radiation. So it's, it is, and it's, it's, it's much lower than a chest CT a chest CT or a, a CT abdomen pelvis, much, much lower than those, but it's much, much higher than a, a chest X-ray because chest X-rays, it's probably about a hundred chest X-rays. Um, but in general, in the big scheme of things, it's actually a very small dose of radiation for the amount of information it provides because it's an individual look at a person's heart vessels um, and the calcium inside it. So it measures the calcium content. Um, we want a score of zero. Uh, a score of zero doesn't tell us that they have no plaque. What it tells us is that they have no calcified plaque. Um, and also it does, it is associated with very low rates of heart attacks. Okay, so it, it's very, very reassuring when someone has a calcium score of zero. Um, anytime someone has a calcium score that is positive, it means that again, they've got calcified plaque. It usually means that they probably have some soft plaque. So soft plaque doesn't show up on these scans because they don't have calcium in them. But um, anyone who has a, a high calcium score definitely has hard plaque as well as soft plaque. So this can really help 
re-stratify someone who's in that intermediate group. So someone who's in the intermediate group, if they've got a positive score, will elevate, you know, we may elevate their risk. Someone who's got a zero score, even if they've got high cholesterol, we may lower their risk in our mind. So this is what it looks like. Um, this is moderate calcifications. This is just a cross section of the heart. Uh, moderate, and these are the arteries around the heart. And this is severe. So you can see that quite nicely how it lights up. Okay. So now let's talk about, so those are the screening tests. Let's talk about what we do. Like, what, you know, we've made a risk assessment. We've done a risk assessment for someone. And now we're going to talk about lifestyle. And lifestyle is always foundational. Uh, but I just want to show you a little bit about how impactful lifestyle interventions can be. So this oh. is data from the ERIC study. And the ERIC study, let's see, people taking calcium and vitamin D will elevate their risk of having, oh, actually, what is it? People taking, for some reason I can't see. Oh, more. Oh, people taking calcium and vitamin D will elevate their risk of having uh, more calcium. Okay. So um, I'll answer that question because it's related. Basically, people who, there is some evidence, and this is again, observational. So there's no causal effect that we can draw, but um, observational data has, we have seen that for people who take calcium supplements, they tend to have higher rates of coronary artery calcium. And um, that, so what we, what, what that data has basically led us to, how, how it's changed what we tell patients is that for patients who um, have osteoporosis, for example, um, we really want you to get most of your calcium, the majority of your calcium, if not all of your calcium from dietary sources, as opposed to from a supplement um, because of this data. And the, the observational data was really looking at supplemental calcium. And so it's not clear whether or not the load of um, calcium that you get from a supplement is different than if you get it from your, from your diet. Okay. Um, but going back to this one, so this is the ERIC study. So the ERIC study was a longitudinal study from 1987 to 2007. Again, these were when people at the start of the ERIC study, they were free of cardiovascular disease and they were followed for 20 years. And they took all of the folks and they looked at all of their different health metrics. These are smoke, you know, did they smoke? What was their BMI, their physical activity level, their composition of their diet, their total cholesterol, their blood pressure, and their fasting blood glucose. And they looked at the cumulative incidence of cardiovascular disease over 20 years. And what they found was that for people who had um, zero uh, risk, zero of their health metrics in the ideal range, they did the best in terms of cumulative, or sorry, they did the worst in terms of cumulative incidence of cardiovascular disease. And for every subsequent health metric that you got into the ideal range, you had lower uh, cumulative incidence of cardiovascular disease. So ideal range would be for smoking, not smoking, and for BMI, it would be less than 25, um, et cetera. So you can, so what really, this is really just to hit home the idea that even if you can't get all of your health metrics in the ideal range, that's okay. For every subsequent health metric you get in the ideal range, it makes a difference. So the first one we'll talk about is exercise. Uh, the gui federal guidelines, basically it's 150 minutes a week of aerobic activity and not or, but and at least two days per week of muscle strengthening activity. This is the one that I find people do not do. I think that many people know about this, let's walk 150 minutes per week, but they really either don't know or don't have time, but this is the one that most people do not do and is, is actually very, very important. Um, we also know that for aerobic activity, getting even more has additional benefits. In terms of uh, what observational data has shown us uh, for exercise and its um, uh, and its association with lowering your cardiovascular risk is it has been associated with a 30 to 40% lower cardiovascular risk. So there is an inverse relationship between physical activity and coronary heart disease and cardiovascular disease risk. For those who do moderate intensity, um, you know, it lowers your risk by 20 to 25%, vigorous intensity even, even more. And in addition to that, we know that for people who have hypertension, it can lower your blood pressure by five to eight millimeters of mercury, um, independent of whether or not you lose weight. So this is a very effective way to treat hypertension without weight loss. It's just, if you exercise on a regular basis, you can lower your blood pressure. And so this is, I, 
on the order of what medicines can do. The other thing that exercise does is it improves insulin sensitivity. So for those who have cardiometabolic dysfunction or cardiometabolic syndrome, remembering that exercise can make a really big difference in improve, improving your insulin sensitivity. So there is a um, hyperbolic relationship between insulin secretion and insulin sensitivity, which basically means that um, for people who have normal glucose tolerance, if they go from being active to being sedentary, their insulin sensitivity decreases and their insulin secretion increases. So that's what this hyperbolic relationship is about. And it's bi-directional, which means that if you are uh, going from sedentary to more active, your insulin sensitivity improves and your insulin secretion goes down. And we actually want insulin secretion to go down because insulin is considered a storage hormone. So the more someone, so having too much insulin secretion, uh, which is the physiologic response to insulin resistance is secreting a lot more insulin, but having a lot of insulin secretion, it causes a lot of downstream um, problems. It causes people to gain weight. It can cause abnormal lipids. So really what, where you want to be is really downstream on this curve where you're very insulin sensitive and you're not having to secrete a lot of insulin. This curve continues to move to the left when we see that people are um, in pre-diabetes and in diabetes where basically they are very insulin resistant. So they're, um, and they're having to secrete a lot of insulin. Um, so their insulin sensitivity is, is going down and they're secreting a lot of insulin. So that's what we're basically seeing. But I think that this really, really illustrates nicely, just it doesn't matter where you are on this curve. If you are becoming more active, you are making a difference in your insulin sensitivity. The other thing is um, just highlighting that the importance of muscle strengthening and activities, which is part of the federal guidelines, is that it combats something called sarcopenia. And sarcopenia is where you are losing your muscle mass and your muscle strength. And this is something that naturally happens as we age. So by the time someone is the age of 50, um, uh, after the age of 50 and above, they're basically decreasing, their muscle mass is decreasing by approximately three to 8% per decade. And once they reach 50, it's even accelerated. It's like 10%. So, you know, the higher you get, the older you get, the more you're, you're losing your muscle mass. And by losing muscle mass, it increases your risk for insulin resistance um, as we age. And oftentimes it's not that losing muscle necessarily makes you gain fat, but they sort of go hand in hand. Oftentimes, you know, if people aren't exercising and building up their, their muscle mass, oftentimes at the same time, they're just gaining fat. Um, and in, 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 op, you know, opposite of that is basically if you increase your muscle mass and you increase your skeletal muscle, you are increasing the amount of glucose that's being taken up by muscle. You've got more muscle that's going to take up more glucose and that improves your insulin sensitivity. <clears throat> so this is really an important strategy for combating insulin resistance is resistance training. Uh, for people who are short on time, there are definitely benefits for high intensity interval training. So many people uh, love to you know, walk, maybe a, a moderate intensity pace, maybe a slow pace, but that there are definitely benefits to doing things faster and specifically at you know, higher intensity, but specifically in intervals. So in a high intensity interval training, otherwise known as HIT, is basically defined as bouts of high intensity activity alternating with brief periods of either rest or, but typically it's lower intensity. So typically it's high, high intensity, and then you drop it back for a certain period of time. Um, and this has been shown in studies to induce greater cardiopulmonary fitness compared to moderate intensity continuous training. Um, and then it improves insulin sensitivity, especially in those who have type two diabetes. So this is a, a great strategy for increasing insulin sensitivity for those who have type two diabetes um, and boosting cardiovascular fitness faster. So it just trains you faster than it does, than moderate intensity does. In addition to exercise, it's also really important to remember that we shouldn't be sitting for prolonged periods um, of time. So in general, adults spend more than seven hours a day on sedentary activities. Uh, sitting for prolonged periods of time is even worse for people who already have a cardiometabolic risk pattern. 
So this is even worse for people who have insulin resistance. It just makes them more and more resistant. Um, and it is really deleterious if, so people have worse cardiometabolic risk patterns and it's really deleterious if they also don't exercise. So they sit, but they don't, they don't offset that with any exercise. And regardless of your activity level, prolonged and uninterrupted sedentary behavior increases your risk for all cause mortality. So I'm gonna show you here. So this is a graph, which I really like. It's in the physical activity guidelines, uh, the updated one for 2018. This shows us the relationship between daily sitting time and moderate to vigorous physical activity. So this is daily sitting time. Um, it's going from very little to a lot. This is moderate to vigorous physical activity going from very little to a lot. And what you basically see here is that if you, for a person who's very physically active, um, it's very protective. And e even for those who are very physically active, if they sit, um, you know, it can offset a lot of the harms from sitting. Um, the other interesting thing though, is for people who don't sit, okay? So this is very little sitting, they're standing all the time. Um, if they don't exercise, not sitting does not completely offset the harms of not exercising. So this is really emphasizing the importance of physical activity and offset and, and you know, sort of how they play together. You know, so ideally you would be exercising and not sitting. There's um, a question asking, um, could you explain a uh, heart rate and weight training? What are what heart rate one should exercise at? Um, in, in exercises such as HIT. Great. So most people, when they're exercising very vigorously, we're trying to get them to probably about 75 to 85% max heart rate. So you get your max heart rate 220 minus your age, and that would be times eight, you know, 0.85, and that would be your heart rate. So vigorous is definitely trying to get you up to at least 85% max. Most people, you could definitely go above 85% max and, you know, for a short period of time. Um, so it's somewhere between like, and it's, again, it is, it kind of depends on a person's fitness level to begin with. So like what might be hit or, or vigorous for one person is going to be different than another person. And it really depends on where they're starting. So I would, if you're going to start doing HIT, I would really gradually do it where um, a lot of times I try and recommend that people do what feels vigorous to them and probably about 85% max, um, what feels vigorous to them for probably about a minute, um, trying to do really vigorous for about a minute. And then you would, you know, it's, you would uh, dial back for probably about third, like another minute. And then you, you know, or even longer sort of you recover, you want to, you basically that rest time is a recovery time for you. So once you feel like you recover, you do it again. And then you, you know, so that's kind of how you, uh, and again, it, it can be adjusted for, um, depending on your fitness level. Okay. The next thing we're going to talk about is your diet. So the diet really matters. Um, we're going to talk about plant-based, uh, diet eating patterns. So these are two plant-based eating patterns and you can see they're really different, but they're both plant-based. Um, this one is full of whole grain, uh, like whole foods and whole grains. And this one is filled with refined carbs and sugar. So we want people to be eating a healthy diet. I know I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but um, vegetables, fruit, whole grains, legumes, nuts, lean vegetables, um, actually, I don't know why I put like, it's actually lean animal protein, you know, prefer fish. I, um, so vegetables are lean to begin with. So I just realized there's a typo here. So, uh, that's what we would want for your healthy diet. And this is an interesting study that looked at, um, plant-based diets. And what they found ultimately was that healthy plant-based diets are associated with a lower coronary heart disease risk. So this study lumped together and took all like took these very large cohort studies, the nurses health study, the nurses health study two, and the health professions follow-up study and included over 200,000 participants. And you can see here that each of these cohorts, not only are they large, but they follow them for a large, you know, for a long period of time. And what they did was, uh, and this is a cohort that everyone was free of chronic disease at the start of the study. And what they did was they took all of the food frequency questionnaire data and they created something called a plant-based diet index, which is called the PDI. 
And this was basically uh, emphasized the consumption of all different kinds of plant-based foods. And in subset of that, they created something called the Healthy Plant Diet Index or HPDI and an unhealthy plant-based diet, UPDI. And the HPDI basically emphasized healthy plant-based things like whole grains, vegetables, fruits, legumes, beans. And the UPDI emphasized sweet, uh, sugar-sweetened beverages, refined grains, um, potatoes, uh, sweet desserts, things like that. And what they, what they basically found was that high adherence to PDI was independently inversely associated with coronary heart disease. So we can kind of see that here. So this is the hazard ratio for coronary heart disease, and this is plant-based diet, so PDI. And then they divide it into HPDI and UPDI. So basically what you can see here is that inverse, it's been inversely associated. So there's a hazard ratio. So we want it to be um, you know, uh, below this line. So essentially there is, this is plant, this is the PDI. So adhering to the PDI is good and inversely associated with coronary heart disease, but adhering to the HPDI is even better. And then if you adhere to the UPDI, it's actually um, associated with a higher risk of coronary heart disease. And then if we actually look at servings of food categories consumed per day, um, again, this it, these are gonna be healthy plant foods here. This is animal foods and this is less healthy plant foods. So you can actually see that healthy plant foods is associated with a lower risk while um, animal foods and less healthy plant foods are associated with a higher risk. So this is just to emphasize health, like your plant-based diet really does matter. Cause a lot of times I see people who they're trying to do things uh, you know, they're trying to change their diet for, for their heart health. But a lot of times when people move from animal based, uh, diets to vegetarian diets, oftentimes they don't know what to eat. So they often will steer towards a very unhealthy plant-based diet, which is with a lot of refined carbs, like a lot of pasta, because it's so easy. Um, and that's really not what we want. That's not how we want people to be doing it. Um, one of the diets that's been really studied heavily in the nutrition literature is the Mediterranean diet. And so the Mediterranean diet is a really uh, great way to go for people who are trying to shift their diet pattern to something a bit healthier. So the Mediterranean diet has, with this study, we're going to talk about the PREDIMED study. The PREDIMED study basically found that the Mediterranean diet reduced cardiovascular risk by 30%. So there are not that many large, well-run, randomized controlled trials in nutrition, and but this was one. So this, the PREDIMED study was a randomized controlled trial, includes um, almost 7,500 people, no known cardiovascular disease. This is a European study, included a good portion of women. They were followed for almost five years. People were randomized either to a Mediterranean diet or to a low fat diet, that, which was considered their control diet. And what they found was the intervention arm, their cardiovascular disease risk was reduced by 30%. So this is very powerful in terms of understanding that adhering to this Mediterranean diet, which is, as you can see, it's very high in whole foods, but does also have animal foods. So it's not that you can't eat animal foods, but a lot of them need to be on the healthier side, like fish. They did a sub-analysis. So this was not the primary outcome, but a sub-analysis showed that the Mediterranean diet also reduced the risk for diabetes, new incidence of diabetes. So that's also um, a very interesting finding. So these were people, a subset of people who had, did not have any diabetes at baseline. Um, there was a 3,500 of them followed for four years and saw that they, uh, for new diabetes was reduced by 30% compared to the control group. And this was independent of weight loss. The other thing about the diet is in addition to what you should be eating, what should you not be eating? And it definitely uh, should not, we should not be drinking sugar sweetened beverages or even artificially sweetened beverages. Artificially sweetened beverages have also been associated with increasing your risk for insulin resistance. And a lot of times for people who are trying to substitute sugar sweetened for artificially sweetened, um, the artificially sweetened beverages still drive that need for sugar. And so what we really ideally want is for people to be off of all of these artificial sweeteners because we wanna teach your palate and your brain that you don't need all that sugar or you don't need all that sweetness, essentially. We wanna limit sodium, we wanna limit saturated fat, and of course, trans fat, which are um, also trans fats and partially hydrogenated vegetable fats, which um, really re does require reading labels. And this usually implies that you are eating something processed. So in general, if we wanna decrease this, we should really just be 
thinking about decreasing processed and packaged foods. I get a lot of questions about dietary cholesterol, which is different than saturated fat. So dietary cholesterol comes in things like shrimp, eggs, and seafood, other types of seafood, shellfish. So the 2015 dietary guidelines specifically on cholesterol um, changed a little bit about what they said. So in the old guidelines, they recommended that people who have high cholesterol not eat more than 300 milligrams per day of cholesterol, um, so which would be equivalent to about one egg, no more than one egg um, or not like approximately one egg. Um, the new guidelines basically said available evidence so shows no appreciable relationship between consumption of dietary cholesterol and serum cholesterol. So what we know now about dietary cholesterol is that it does its impact on someone's cholesterol is not that strong in comparison to saturated fat. So saturated fat there, it comes from other animals like meat, like red meat, pork, dairy, cheese, butter, that sort of thing. Um, uh, coconut oil, um, those sort of things, they really have an impact on, on cholesterol. They really can drive it up. Dietary cholesterol, less so. And however, a lot of foods have both in them. And so what the American Heart Association Science Advisory says is um, dietary guidance should really focus on a healthy dietary pattern that is inherently relatively low in cholesterol. So that's kind of what you're going to find is that if you're trying to eat foods that are low in saturated fat, you're probably going to be eating foods that are also low in cholesterol. We've talked about what to eat, what not to eat. Let's talk a little bit about well, when to eat. So fasting, uh, fasting. There are two oh. questions if you want oh. to answer it now or do you want to save it for later? Um, oh, sure. So let's see. Okay. Oh, have you looked at the diet fit study for Christopher Gart? Yes. So yeah. So I mean, I, I don't think, yes. So basically, you know, a lot of times when we think about diets, uh, ultimately it is also about, can you, you know, can you stick to a diet? You know, it's, it's almost like, uh, and a lot of times when we talk to people about diets, a lot of what we are trying to do is not always just weight reduction, um, but we're really also looking at how can we shift your eating pattern so that your cardiovascular health is better. So a lot of it is we try to modify people's diets so that they can adhere to it. And because uh, what we want is we want it to be sustainable. A sustainable, healthy diet is really ultimately the way to go, as opposed to prescribing that you eat the South Beach diet or that you eat this diet or that you, you know, so, so I would say that's ultimately um, what tends to matter is that it's sustainable. Um, and then all these studies based on your reference predates year 1917. Are there any recent studies? And it just, oh, so um, the PREDIMED study was not 1917. The PREDIMED style uh, study was 2000 and let's see, the PREDIMED study was relatively recent. So the PREDIMED, so uh, this was a redo of the, um, of the analysis, but this one's a relatively recent style. Was that 1917? Was that, um, did you mean to type something else out? Uh, I the believe reason? the Mediterranean diet says 2015, uh, and that's what uh, uh, the the participant is mentioning. Uh, the, for Mediterranean diet, um, that is 2015. Um, so yeah, yeah I, I believe that's a typo probably. Oh, okay, okay. There was nothing from 1917. No, no oh, oh, you, I, I, um, all these are on your, yeah, so I, yeah, no, I mean, um, I would say that um, the the thing about nutrition diet, the nutrition studies is that a lot of them are observational. And the reason why I think it's very important to think about the PREDIMED style is specifically because it's randomized control trial. So a lot of times with these observational data, we can make these associations, um, but specifically from a cardiovascular randomized control trial and diet. PREDIMED style, the PREDIMED study is a really important addition to the literature from that standpoint. I hope I answered your question. There is a follow-up question saying that, what, what about isolated proteins when you are on a plant-based diet to, just to add some protein to increase the level of protein intake? So that's one question. And then there is another question about um, 
uh, for a S Indian and South Asian uh, diet uh, because it's mostly plant-based diet. However, it's misleading because uh, along with the plant-based diet, you consume a lot of carbs and fat and spices. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. the comment is that I think um, it would be beneficial to have more contextual diet guidance. So if you have any comment on these two. Yeah, so definitely I would say that the a lot of times when we're trying to shift people's diet, we really like to know what it is you're eating because we do need to, we don't want to just shift your diet to something completely different. I think what we have seen over and over again is really that uh, the more we can move foods to whole foods, less processed, less refined is really where we want to go and less saturated fat. So a lot of times what I will do is I try to refer my patients who are on uh, South Asian diets to a South Asian dietitian so that they can work with you just to try and refine, tweak whatever you're eating so that we can kind of get rid of some of the more refined things. Because again, just being on a vegetarian diet is not necessarily a healthy diet. It really depends on what it is you're eating. That's, that's super important. Um, the other, what was the other, what was your first question? The other question? Um, it isolated protein. Uh, yeah. Just, yeah. So basically a lot of uh, plant-based diets have plenty of protein in them. So it's just, and again, for someone who's moving from animal protein to plant protein, it's, it's really good to meet with a dietitian because we do want to make sure you are getting enough protein. Like part of the problem with people when they're aging is a lot of times people who are aging, they're losing muscle naturally. And many older people don't eat as much. They may not eat as much and they're, they're kind of very particular about what they eat. And so sometimes they're not getting enough protein. Like their protein actually is decreasing um, along with the amount that they're eating is decreasing. And, um, and so, and I think a lot of people think that you can only get most protein or good protein from animals. That's not really not true. You get plenty of protein from plant-based foods and, but really trying to move from animals to plants. Usually a lot of education has to go along with, well, what can I eat? And, and, um, and so meeting with a dietitian can be really helpful. Okay. So let's talk about, um, fasting regimens. Cause I know that this is actually something that's uh, pretty popular and this is fasting has been around for centuries for various reasons, traditions, cultural reasons, religious reasons. Um, the, the ones that we often most often see the dietitians recommend, or that I recommend is something called a fasting, a modified fasting regimen where you five days a week, you're eating fairly regularly healthy, but two days per week, you are decreasing your energy needs to about 20 to 25% <clears throat> on those. So usually it's about, you end up eating probably about 500 kilocalories per day on the days that you're fasting. And then, um, these fasting regimens, there is literature that shows that they do have a overall metabolic benefit, um, it better than just energy sort of continuously lowering your kilocalories per day. So, uh, for some people, instead of eating a thousand kilocalories per day, you know, is to really fat, like really to strenuously reduce your kilocalories for two days. That, that seems like it may have some additional benefits. This type of fasting I find can be difficult for people. So the other type that I find many people can adhere to very well is something called time-restricted eating, where what you're doing is you're restricting the amount uh, the, or the number of hours per day that you're eating to just usually about eight, somewhere between six and eight. And then you're fasting somewhere between 16 and 18 hours per day. People can start uh, by just prolonging their nighttime fast. So everybody's fasting when they're sleeping, but you just prolong that fast through the day. Um, and that can actually allow you to fast for a longer period of time. And I try and get people to do this every single day and have it become a habit. And I find that this can work for, for many people. I do not recommend this for people who don't feel well when they're fasting. I don't recommend this for people who, have any history of eating disorders at all, this is really not meant for them. This is something that I often use for anyone who's got cardiometabolic syndrome, because it can be very, uh, very helpful in improving their insulin sensitivity. So fasting uh, does tend to affect sort of these health outcomes like obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and cancer, 
And some of the mechanisms by how it does that is through the circadian rhythm, the gut microbiome and lifestyle behaviors. And in terms of our circadian rhythm, we have internal clocks. Our central clock is in our brain and our peripheral clocks are in our tissues. So our peripheral clocks and our liver, our skeletal muscle, our gut. And these, when our central clock is, de is not synchronized with our peripheral clocks, it can actually cause a lot of metabolic problems. So it's almost like if you are meant to be eating mostly during the day, but you're eating mostly at night, it can really mess up the, it can actually harm your metabolism. So, um, and your, in terms of circadian rhythm, our bodies are really functioning a lot better during the day. So things are, the metabolism is faster during the day. It's more efficient during the day. And so that's what this circadian rhythm has an impact on your metabolism during your, during the day and your GI function and microbiome also follow a circadian rhythm. So like your gut, for example, it like the gastric emptying. So when we eat food, just how quickly it moves through our stomach, it slows down at night. And so when you eat a meal, it's going to hang around in your stomach a little bit longer at night because it just doesn't pass through as, as quickly And your microbiome also has a circadian rhythm. So when we eat at night, the, the gut microbiome, because it changes throughout the day, it doesn't process food as well. And so for people who have a tendency to eat a lot of their heavier meals at night, those meals tend to not get processed as efficiently. A lot of that can be stored as fat. And then that's how, uh, and we do know that people who do not sleep as many hours or stay up late at night, they tend to have a higher risk of gaining weight. And then fasting regimens can affect your lifestyle in general, because one very obvious reason is that if you're fasting, you can be you know, you will be decreasing the amount of food that you intake. So that's one factor. It can affect your sleep. Many people who fast sleep better and sleeping then can affect your metabolic regulation, all of these things. And so all of these things sort of play a role in how fasting can affect your metabolic regulation. And then ultimately your health outcomes. Um, in terms of other interventions, I don't necessarily recommend everyone lose weight but I certainly do recommend that people lose weight, especially for those who have any evidence of cardiometabolic disease, because the most common reason people have cardiometabolic disease is because of insulin resistance, which came about because they have excess weight. So if someone has a waist circumference that's in the abdominal obesity range, definitely weight loss is necessary. People don't need to lose that much weight. It, we tend to see an improvement in cardiometabolic cardi markers if they lose somewhere between five to 10% of their weight, um, it really can make a difference. Just a small, a small amount of weight can make a difference uh, really through ideally lifestyle interventions, but we have pharmaceuticals and we have bariatric surgery. So many people are becoming more and more familiar with the pharmaceuticals that we use. And so I'll talk a little bit about those. Um, the nef next lifestyle intervention is smoking. So we all know that smoking cigarettes increases your coronary artery disease risk two to four fold. So it's pretty dramatic. Uh, a lot of cigarette smokers will move to e-cigarettes and which I will talk about, but, um, what many people don't know is that smoking increases your risk for diabetes because smoking, uh, root, like will affect your insulin sensitivity. So there there's 30 to 40% more likely to develop type two diabetes than people who don't smoke. And then also recent studies have linked e-cigarettes to a 55% increased risk for heart attacks. So, e so even though people think that e-cigarettes might be safer than cigarettes, they also are quite harmful. So smoking cessation ultimately is, is optimal. Managing stress. So we've talked about stress. So chronic stress is the problem. It's really not necessarily acute stress. It's the chronic steady stress. It is, what it does is it causes um, a hormone change and it can increase, which ultimately can increase our blood pressure, our heart rate, and even our blood sugar as our stress hormones are very high. And over time, this would really lead to increased risk for uh, diabetes and cardiovascular disease and even cancer. So these are just some very effective ways to manage chronic stress. So uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction, which is a six week course that uh, many people find very helpful to help them manage stress, meditation, I usually recommend 20 minutes twice a day. Um, that's the recommendation for meditation for it to be um, very helpful for people. Exercise, of course, and then yoga. Uh, 
And then sleep is the other lifestyle intervention. We This was just added this year to uh, the American Heart Association's uh, uh, health metrics. So they used to have seven health metrics, which were diet, exercise, blood glucose, your weight, your lipids, your blood pressure, and smoking. And they just added sleep. And so now they've changed it from um, life simple seven to life's essential eight. And it's because we know that poor sleep is linked with cardiovascular disease, obesity, metabolic syndrome, hypertension, and that it's not just the number of hours you sleep, but it's the quality of your sleep. So a lot of my patients who have obstructive sleep apnea, they, they might sleep many, many hours, but they don't feel good when they wake up because they've got poor quality of sleep. So the prevalence of obstructive sleep apnea is fairly high in people who have obesity. So it's quite high, 40%. And it's really that chronic exposure to hypoxia, which is a decreased oxygen in your, in your bloodstream is it induces insulin resistance. Um, and then insomnia is basically not being able to fall asleep or not being able to stay asleep. This is also quite prevalent. Uh, 10% of Americans, it does disproportionately affect women and older people and you, sleep aids are not the first thing that we like to use. We like to use something called cognitive behavioral therapy, which I like to mention because I find that many people do not know about this and it's very effective and insomnia is harmful. And so many people don't realize how harmful insomnia is either. So, but cognitive behavioral therapy is delivered by uh, psychotherapists or counselors, people who are trained in this type of um, skill. And it is very effective for, or for getting people to sleep and also people off sleep aids. Blood pressure is the other thing is so important to know what your blood pressure is. Anytime it is checked, the normal is less than 120 over 80. And it's also very important to know whether or not you have normal blood pressure. Uh, this is the way that we monitor at home. People should be sitting feet on the ground. Their rest, their back should be relaxed they sh and their arm should be around heart level. And usually we like people to sit for a few minutes before they check their first blood pressure. In terms of how we think about control, we like to divide we uh, people between high risk group and lower risk group. For people who have elevated blood pressure, um, for those who are high risk, we tend to start medication uh, right, you know, right away, even when they are at this level. For people who are at lower risk, we tend to use lifestyle <clears throat> when they're at this level, and then if and then only drugs if we can't, you know, if lifestyle is not effective. So if we're, you know, trying to use lifestyle and it's really not making much of a difference, then we try and use drugs. But we do, we do think about uh, whether or not people are high risk or low risk for cardiovascular disease. These are some non-farm ways to uh, reduce blood pressure. You can see some of the most effective is a healthy diet, which really also encompasses having reduced sodium and enhanced potassium. So potassium comes in fruits a lot of fruits and vegetables and potassium offsets the harms of sodium. So if you have a, a diet that's very rich in vegetables and fruit, you're tending to get a lot of potassium and that helps to lower your blood pressure. And then in combination with lowering your sodium, it on par, it actually reduces your blood pressure even further. This activity we talked about and then moderation alcohol. Cholesterol, um, I'll just briefly mention that these are the desired ranges for cholesterol, uh, less than 200 for total, your triglycerides less than 150, your H HDL 60, your LDL 60 to 130. Um, ideally, ideally, it'd be less than 100. Um, and then we don't pay so much attention to this cholesterol ratio anymore. But uh, even though this particular one says four, we tend to strive for less than 3.5, um, which basically means that your total cholesterol is low and your HDL is high. Um, we also used to only re exclusively use fasting lipid profiles, but now we use, you'll see us use more and more non-fasting lipid profiles because the majority of people tend to still live in a non-fasting state. And so it's really nice to know when someone's not fasting, what's happening with their triglycerides? Because for people who have insulin resistance, a lot of times when they're not fasting, their triglycerides will be abnormal, but when they're fasting, their triglycerides will be normal. And so it's, I like to know, is there any evidence that their triglycerides are elevated when they are not fasting? Um, let's see here. So these are, you know, I, I've gone over 
this already, but this is basically uh, major recommendations for management of blood cholesterol. Uh, this is secondary prevention for people who have uh, already have athro. Um, what we, we tend to do is we, for all of them, they all are eligible for high intensity statins. For primary prevention, when you don't have heart, you don't have any, no stroke, no heart attack yet, we tend to reserve high intensity for a few groups. Those who have LDLs 190 and above, and those who are very high risk, like their scores are very high and their cholesterol, their LDL is still above 70. And then for people who have diabetes, if their scores are not that high, we want all patients with diabetes um, to be on a moderate intensity statin. And then we, we will bump them up to a high intensity statin if they are higher risk. Um, for all our patients who are of intermediate risk, we tend, in, uh, according to the, the pooled cohort equation, we tend to offer them moderate intensity statins or at least start the conversation. So let's get into pharmaceuticals. Um, so pharmaceuticals, there are quite a few um, that we use. The statins are the most common one that we, I'm sure all of you guys have heard about statins. That's the, that's the first line. The second line is azetamibe. And this one is, doesn't have any systemic absorption. So for people who have any systemic symptoms from statins, we, this is our second line. This is what we go to um, add on because it prevents cholesterol reabsorption in the gut, but it doesn't have, it doesn't get absorbed. The, the medicine doesn't get absorbed into your system and it only works at your gut level. PCSK9 inhibitors are monoclonal antibody injections that prevent the degradation of the LDL receptors. So by preventing the degradation of LDL receptors, it leaves more LDL receptors on the surface um, of the cell. So then more LDL could be captured by the LDL receptors and brought in. So that's how these, so these are the three main ones that we use. Um, there's been a lot of controversy about whether or not statins are helpful in women, um, but this is just one study from Lancet uh, looking at meta-analysis by sex, uh, combined 27 randomized control trials looking at statin versus placebo and 27% um, women. So not that many women, but women were included with a follow-up of 4.9 years. And the effect of statin treatment was similar among men and women at similar cardiovascular disease risk levels. Um, statin therapy is... Um, has been shown to lower major coronary events by 20% for every 38 milligram, milligrams per deciliter of reduction in LDL. So this is basically the idea, this has been shown in the literature that the lower we get your cholesterol, the better. So for every 38 milligrams per deciliter that we lower the LDL, we're just, it's another 20% we're lowering your risk. These are the newest ones on the market or the lowest ones in our armamentarium of meds that we use in, in prevention. So initially the SGLT2 inhibitors were for, uh, initially they were used for type two diabetes, but more and more you are seeing people in cardiology and in renal um, and nephrologists using this to reduce cardiovascular disease risk and chronic kidney disease risk and heart failure risk. Um, so the way the SGLT2s work is they prevent reabsorption of glucose. And so what's happening is more glucose is lost in the urine. And that's initially how it has been, how it lowers um, people's glucose. The next family is the SGL, the, the GLP-1 receptor um, antagonists. So these are agonists. So these are initially again, used for type two diabetes but more and more you're seeing us use them for cardiovascular disease risk um, reduction in patients who have diabetes and also for weight loss. Um, the weight loss indication is for anyone who has a BMI greater than 30 or someone who's got a BMI greater than 27 with at least one weight related comorbidity, such as fatty liver, sleep apnea, hypertension, any of those. And the way these work is uh, they work in several, there are several different mechanisms, but when, when we eat food, GLP-1 is secreted in response to food and the GLP-1, um, these, the, these meds decrease our appetite so that there's a signaling in the brain decreases our, so people on GLP-1 will, they will have, a, they'll lose their appetite for foods, they'll eat less. And also it stimulates um, insulin secretion and it slows gastric emptying, so gastric emptying, so people will feel full for a longer period of time. 
The next one we use is aspirin. So aspirin used to be very commonly given out in prevention, in primary prevention. So secondary prevention, it's always given. Um, because if people have had a heart attack or a stroke, aspirin is, there's no controversy at all. But there was a lot of controversy about using aspirin in primary prevention because aspirin always carries that risk of bleeding. And in primary prevention, it's not always certain. Does the risk of bleeding outweigh or does the benefit of aspirin outweigh the harms of bleeding? So there have been three very large, well-run clinical trials using aspirin in primary prevention. And now the, um, we are only using aspirin, the low dose, which is the 81 milligrams in people 40 to 70 years old who are at high risk for cardiovascular disease and who don't have an increased risk for bleeding. We do not routinely use it in anyone who's 70 and above. For people who have R70 and above who are already on aspirin, we tend to, if we can, I tend to stop the aspirin if they're interested in stopping the aspirin, but the current guidelines don't tell us what to do with people who are doing fine on it. So for people who've been on it for decades and decades and they're 85 years old and they haven't had a GI bleed yet, um, there's not a lot in the guidelines to tell us what to do with those people. Uh, but we definitely don't use it in people who have any risk for GI bleeding. Okay, so that was my last slide, but the take home messages are that um, atherosclerotic disease is a chronic inflammatory disease that for people who have risk factors, it, by the time someone's 40 and above, if that you've not had some sort of risk assessment, it's really important to get a risk assessment. Uh, of course, younger, if people have more risk factors or if they've got longstanding diabetes and they really do need a risk assessment sooner. The most important way to prevent cardiometabolic disease and cardiovascular disease is definitely promoting a healthy lifestyle throughout the lifespan, um, even you know, as starting as when people are kids and aspirin should be used infrequently in routine primary prevention. Um, just emphasizing statin therapy is the first line of lipering, lipid lowering if it's needed. And that blood pressure goal on treatment should be less than 130 over 80. And that's, that's all I have. And let me see if there's any other questions in the chat. Thank you so much. Uh, it, this was really informative and uh, helpful. Uh, there is one more question. Can you please comment on uh, atherosclerosis of aorta as uh, uh, seen on regular chest x-rays, but lipid profile is normal and good? Yeah, so anytime we see atherosclerosis in any way, um, on anything, but whether it be a random CT scan that you got for another reason or a chest X-ray that you got for another reason, um, it does tell us that despite having good cholesterol, you have a tendency to form plaque. And like I was telling before, plaque takes decades to form. There's a, you know, there's a lifespan to plaque. And the longer it's there, the more likely calcium is going to embed in it. Um, because plaque that hasn't formed calcium can go away actually. So when, when someone doesn't have any calcium in it, that can actually regress with a healthy lifestyle. But if someone, if, but if it's in the aorta, it could be elsewhere too. It could be in the cerebral arteries. It can be in the coronary arteries. So we tend to recommend that you get further screening. Like you certainly could get cardiac screening to see whether or not there's any calcium in the coronary arteries. Um, but we do like people to lower their statin and lower the start a statin to lower their cholesterol. And there's also that anti-inflammatory effect that comes with the statin. Oh, to the recommendations. Oh, so these recommendations, take home messages. Oh, um, yes. Did someone have a question about any of these? Or any additional questions, just um, if you, I think we have like a few minutes left if anyone just wants to, to um, shout out a question or happy to answer anything else. And Susan, should I stop sharing my screen, do you think? Um, sure, absolutely. Uh, thank you so much. I will also stop uh, the recording. I really appreciate uh, everyone and uh, uh, everyone for attending and uh, appreciate um, uh, Sandra, your uh, presentation was very informative and useful. Thank you so much. Uh, I will stop recording.